I'm delighted to present to you our first speaker. She's better known as the activist mommy. She certainly is an activist. With well over 70 million views, I can't possibly keep up with all of the, the stats that show the, the audience that she has, the, the extent to which she is reaching out and, and the people are responding to her. Uh, her interviews on major news outlets, her commentary on cutting edge cultural issues, her best selling book, which is for sale, there's still a few copies out there. And she certainly is a mommy, the activist mommy, with 10 beautiful children. Um, we have one with her this evening. Uh, she even homeschools, she and her husband homeschool all those children. The question is how? How does she do all this? Well, to I've already kind of told you, because two of the reasons are here with her tonight, her husband Patrick and her daughter Anna. We're delighted to have them with us. <clears throat> I had fuzz, fun visiting with eight of the other children in D.C. when they came to watch their mom receive the full-time homemaker award. As she says, they are wonderful. They, no doubt, are also her motivation. She's a good example of the difference one person driven by her family and her faith can do as she speaks out for what is right and good and true in God's sight. Please join me in welcoming our friend and longtime eagle, Elizabeth Johnston. Thank you so much. Good evening. It is wonderful to be in the great state of Alabama. I believe the last time I was here, I was in front of a microphone at a very stressful press conference in honor of the great patriot Judge Roy Moore, who is here in the room with us tonight. And uh, I believe it's important for us to stick together as conservatives and patriots. The left does this very well, and we could take a lesson from the way they stick together. And this man's family has been brutalized by not only the left, but rhino Republicans, as we all know. And so we need to make sure that we support those who are uh, suffering for the cause. Yes, I do have 10 amazing children. Yes, they're all ours. And yes, we do know what causes it. And uh, the last 20 years, basically, all I've done is homeschool my children because who wants little Marxist zombies to come home every day to you? So, uh, why am I here? I have no impressive credentials like Mr. Gorka has here tonight, and uh, I cannot wait to hear his, his message. But I am a very ordinary homeschooling mother who got off of the sidelines and onto the front lines of this culture war because 200 pound men having access to our daughter's locker rooms and shower rooms is not okay. You can interact, it's okay. We like a loud, vibrant audience. You know, 3,000 babies dying every day with the blessing of our government through abortion is not okay, and we need to get loud about that. <laughs> Taxpayer-funded schools allowing pornographic, gender-bending sex education in every district in this nation is not okay. Taxpayer-funded libraries allowing drag queens to come in and read gender-bending books to our children is not okay. And everywhere I looked, it was like just zombies. <laughs> There's no response. You know, we're very obedient, and we just do what we're told, right? And there's no outrage. There's no, there's no appropriate mama bear response. And I'm looking for one. And I'm not seeing one. And you know, the left is very good at indoctrination, right? And they have the mainstream media to support their, them and their cause of indoctrination. They say biological men can be women. No, no, they can't. <laughs> oh, well, yes, they can. Biological men can be women. Men can be women. Oh, oh, okay. Men can be women, I guess, now. All right. Fetuses aren't people. They're not human. Well, actually, the textbooks say, no, no, fetuses are not human. Oh, okay. Then it's okay to kill them, I guess. And we just roll over and acquiesce time after time. It's mind control. 
Communists have used mind control for decades, and we know that the modern left is very good at it. They don't need torture chambers. They have Twitter, right? If you say that children should uh, not be subjected to drag queen story hour and you mobilize citizens to call the library, Twitter bots come after you and find out where you live and where you uh, work and they, um, they give you death threats, they threaten to kill you and your children, all because you ask citizens to call their library. <laughs> this is a modern torture chamber, right? The left doesn't need re-education camps, they have Facebook. What happens if you say a man can't be a woman on Facebook? You get banned for 30 days, right? And then, I mean, 30 days, you know, when your family and everyone, all your friends are interacting with one another on Facebook and sharing pictures and events and whatnot, 30 days is a while to go without it. And then once that 30-day ban is up, you have to kind of think long and hard about whether you want to be so outspoken or not. That's called a re-education. That's what they're doing to us. Modern mind control. They know in liberty-loving America, they can't throw us in concentration camps. And so they have stealthily infiltrated our schools and the media and begun to brainwash us all. You know how it works. Donald Trump's a racist pig. Donald Trump's a racist pig. <laughs> Donald Trump puts kids in cages, right? And if they say it long enough and loud enough, people began to believe it's actually true. So I had to get off the sidelines. I had to stop waiting for the huge, well-funded organizations to rise up and to do bold things that are quite controversial. For instance, when I learned that Teen Vogue magazine was teaching kids in a fashion magazine how to sodomize one another, excuse me, but hello, it's 2020, and this is what they're doing to our children to our children's minds. When I learned that they did that, I asked my husband, would he please build me a little bonfire in the backyard? And I got my iPhone. <laughs> and I burned a copy of Teen Vogue magazine in a little two minute video that I thought a couple of people would watch. And we started Operation Pull Teen Vogue. And I was ruthlessly, brutally mocked and told that I was giving Teen Vogue advertisement and um, called a Nazi book burner and whatnot. And five months later, a publication that's been in print since I was a little girl printed its last print edition. <laughs> Everyday ordinary mama bears destroyed Teen Vogue, a Condé Nast publication. And people began to be inspired by, hey, you know what? Maybe we can make a difference. Maybe everyday moms can make a difference. When I kept learning that pornographic sex education was in our schools and I was seeing no pushback from parents, I said, okay, I'm done. I'm done griping about this. We've got to do something. Did you know that every child has a dollar sign over their head for the every day that they go to school? They receive, uh, the school receives a certain amount of state and federal money for that child per day that they are in attendance at school. When I learned this, I was like, oh, okay, this is good. They won't listen to us. They won't get the pornography out of the schools. They won't get the gender bending, LGBT sex ed out of the schools. We will hit them where it hurts, in the pocketbook. And so we organized a grassroots sex ed sit out where we told the parents to make sure on April 23rd their children were not in attendance at school. They gave their uh, principal a letter that explained why they were opting out of school that day. Schools lost... I mean, one school at a time would lose over $100,000 on April 23rd. It turned into a global movement in four countries. I have no funding, okay? I am no FRC. I am no, you know, um, uh, although I love all those organizations, I don't, I don't have a big family organization. This is as grassroots as grassroots gets, okay? Totally kitchen sink. This turns into a global movement in Australia, Canada, the UK, uh, and America, of course. And let me tell you, administrators are beginning to listen to the parents because parents now know what is in the, se what is in the sex education in their schools. Guys, we can make a difference. These drag queen story hours, we have shut many of them down simply by mobilizing parents 
to call the libraries and to say, no, we will not accept this kind of propaganda in our tax fu taxpayer funded libraries. This is unacceptable. And where is the response? Where is the appropriate response to these issues? I was just being myself by responding, okay? Because this is what moms do. They protect innocent children, right? This should be our natural mama bear response. By the way, the stupid thing, stupidest thing you can do to a mama bear uh, in, in the wild is mess with her cub, right? She will eat off your face and spit out your bones. We need a little bit more of that in our culture. A little bit more of the eating off of the faces and spitting out the bones. That's a good thing. That's normal. But unfortunately, I have found that these responses to these issues that, that people have, have watched, it's very uncommon and it should not be. And I was just speaking with, with uh, Sebastian at, this, at the table about this, about how little courage there is left, it appears, uh, in our nation. It's too uncommon in America, courage is, the kind of courage that we have, for instance, watched Judge Roy Moore and his family exhibit throughout the, the monstrous attack that they have uh, endured. This kind of courage is far too uncommon. People have become very obedient little Marxists here in America. And people will message me and come up to me at, at conferences and, and whatnot, speaking engagements, and they'll say, hey, I need you to fight something for me. And they'll whisper in my ear and they'll say, this is what it is, but don't tell anybody that I told you because if they find out it was me, I'll get fired. And I'm like, okay. Well, I'm happy to fight that, but I actually might get killed if I fight this. See, I get death threats. <laughs> and my children, we get our lives threatened to fight this. So you want me to risk my life to fight what you're going through, but you're not willing to risk your job to fight what's happening in your own city, in your own town, your own community. This is the kind of courage that we need to begin to exhibit. I draw tremendous strength from the examples of our courageous forerunners in the word of God. Noah, who was mocked for 150 years before he built that boat. The Hebrew midwives who defied Pharaoh's order to kill the Hebrew children. Daniel, who told the scheming leaders to kiss his grits. He was going to pray anyway, right? That's my version of Daniel's story because I'm from Georgia, so we can say that, right? <laughs> This is our heritage. I know most, most of the uh, people in this room tonight are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our heritage. And how did we become such sideliners? How did we become such pew warmers? When I read these stories, I feel like I could scale a wall, you know? And that's, that's the intention of these stories. They are supposed to to inspire us. Can anyone else relate in this room? Do you feel like you could do anything when you read these stories? So I am here to infuse you with some encouragement. Has anyone ever realized what word is right in the middle of encourage? Courage. You see, the whole point of encouragement is so that we'll actually do something that requires courage. So if I'm able to encourage you tonight, that you have God on your side, and that little old ordinary people can do great things. Courage will rise in this room, and that is my job tonight. And the reason I can encourage you is because I am not a fatalist. I do not believe this is over. I believe we can still save this great republic. I'm not one of those who says, oh, well, this is what was prophesied would happen in the end. It's just, it's just going to get worse. There's nothing we can do about it right? Let's just wait for Jesus to come back and rescue us from everything. No, Jesus didn't say, hide and hunker down until I come. He actually said, occupy until I come. There is work for us to do. There is a kingdom to build. And another reason why I am not a fatalist is because I have been studying game tape, and I have realized that this push for bigger government, this push for sexualization of children, unthinkable. This push for the erosion of parental rights and this push for the destabilization of the traditional family is not accidental. 
And it's not a natural progression of living in, you know, a more enlightened society. It's actually very intentional. And that actually encourages me because if mere men are intentionally doing this, then mere men and women can intentionally undo this. Can I get an amen? How much time do I have? Okay. So I'm going to skip uh, the things that I want you to read sometime in the, uh, the book, The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen, who I know some of you in this room are very familiar with the 45 communistic goals that were read in a congressional record in 1963. And they will shock you if you have not read them yet. You will see that um, those were read into Congress as a warning to us and to our nation that if we do not wake up, this is what is coming to our country. And they have done exactly what they said they would do. And we were warned that they would do. And we have sat in our church pews, sat in our lazy boys and let it happen. And that has got to stop. So check that out, the naked communists. In order to conquer a people, the people must be weakened right? And the family must be destabilized. And we, the U.S., we are the standard bearer of liberty. I mean, how, how much of the world can you say is not atheistic, communistic, very dark? And so it's very important that we be taken out if their agenda is to be completed. Faith must be overthrown because a righteous people won't lie or kill when leaders tell them to, will they? I just heard a Chinese Christian say that communists aren't scared of the wealthy or the powerful. They're scared of believers. They're scared of faith because you can't control a person of faith. And I've made it one of my missions to convince Americans that this is an intentional takeover by social Marxists. And I am encouraged that we have the God of heaven on our side and we can overcome this attack if we will only believe God. We can undo this mess. We cannot be fatalists. We have to fight for a better America. And we have to stop fighting these battles like we have something to be ashamed of. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. Okay? They do. Is anyone tired of begging for crumbs from the left? Like we owe them something? I'm tired of the, the one step forward and two steps back pro-life political game, for instance. I hope the life is one of the most important issues in this room here tonight. I'm confident that it is. You see, when the left wants legal abortion, they go for it. And they don't care what you think about them, do they? They don't just go for first trimester abortion. They go for abortion for any reason whatsoever all the way through. We, on the other hand, we fight these cowardly battles like Okay, can we make the, the mommy wait 24 hours before she murders her child, please? A 24-hour waiting period? Can, can we make sure that you can't kill the baby through partial birth abortion? You can kill the baby the other, other way, but please not through partial birth abortion. Do you see what they're doing to us? What we've allowed them to do to us? They don't give us an inch, but we give them a mile and we sit there and beg for an inch. When's that going to stop? When are we going to take a mile? When are we going to stand on principle and justice for all, not just some, depending on your age? The left would freak out if we tried to ban all abortion. Who cares if they freak out? <laughs> Let the left scream. They're screaming anyway. They're screaming about your 24-hour waiting period. So let them scream. We need to stop bowing down and worshiping these judicial tyrants in black robes who said 47 years ago that it was okay to murder innocent babies. If we're going to carry the mantle of Phyllis Schlafly, we have to talk about judicial tyranny and fight judicial tyranny because Phyllis fought judicial tyranny. And Roe v. Wade is judicial tyranny. Obergefell versus Hodges, which legalized so-called gay marriage, which is not marriage at all. Obergefell versus Hodges is judicial tyranny because courts can't make laws, number one. Number two, SCOTUS is entirely out of its jurisdiction to be telling Alabama that you cannot protect your unborn children. 
And number three, SCOTUS cannot overrule the law of God, right? SCOTUS cannot kick God Almighty off of his throne, let me tell you, as much as they might try. So someone needs to start acting like this. And I just want to mention one more thing here. You know, in 2001 and 2005, Supreme Court ruled against miracle, uh, medical marijuana. Do you know how many states are defying this, defying the courts and have medical marijuana today? And states should be allowed to make these decisions, right? We have got so many states defying the courts on medical marijuana and sanctuary cities. Oh, if we only loved our preborn neighbor as much as the pot smokers love their pot, or as much as the pot users, I should say, love their pot. Oh, if we only loved unborn babies as much as the Democrats love getting their votes from the, from the uh, immigrants from the sanctuary cities that they are defying. So we need to see some more of this kind of pushback. We need to stop rolling over and we need to never give up. Thank you guys so much for your patience. I've got my, uh, some of my books. Actually, we just learned tonight that some of my boxes did not arrive, and I apologize for that. And so because of that error, I would like to ask you to go to activismommy.com if you would like to learn more about the things that I have very quickly encapsulated in this lecture. Um, you will get them from my book, which is called Not On My Watch. And if you go to activismommy.com, you can get the book there. God bless you all. Thank you for coming tonight.